Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. Although he died well over a thousand years ago, the life and work of Charlemagne is revered by many in Europe today. It is the spirit of Charlemagne that so many of Europe's leaders today wish to recapture. On today's program, we ask why. Why is Europe reviving this particular legacy? Why is Europe showcasing Charlemagne's imperial heritage on such a grand scale? We'll explain on today's show. The Trumpet Daily. Last year, Sebastian Kurtz became the youngest ever chancellor of Austria. He's a charismatic 32-year-old who has captured the imagination of his countrymen. He's also a deeply religious man who proudly maintains that his religion guides his politics. Right now, Kurtz is also serving out a six-month term as president of the European Council. One of his goals as council president is to protect Europe. Kurtz has taken a strong stance against the flood of immigrants coming into Europe, and he has popular support. Kurtz also wants to strengthen the tie that binds together East and West Europe. And he also wants to see Europe return to its spiritual roots. And he's not alone. There's an increasing number of politicians and commentators in Europe who are turning to European history for solutions to our modern day problems. Many point to Charlemagne and say, this is the spirit that we need to revive today. Well, Charlemagne waded through rivers of blood as he imposed his religion on Central Europe. Is that really the solution to Europe's troubles today? We're going to go through a lot of Bible prophecy today, and much of it is history. And it's history that really does inform us about Europe today. We'll start our study in Daniel chapter 2. If you go and get your Bible and read along with me, read what God has to say about this final resurrection of that old empire, the Holy Roman Empire. The Bible says there's one more that's prophesied to come onto the scene right before the return of Christ to this earth. Now, Daniel chapter 2, this really gives us a wonderful one-chapter overview of world events, particularly European events that have transpired over the past thousands of years. It's this image of Daniel 2, this great image that uh, the prophet Daniel explain the meaning of verse 32 of Daniel 2. It says, The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So history and, of course, Bible prophecy teaches us that this is talking about four world-ruling empires or kingdoms. First, the, the Chaldean Empire or the Babylonians. That's the head of gold. And then following that, the Persian Empire and then the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and then finally the Roman Empire, four world-ruling kingdoms. That's the framework that God establishes in this second chapter of Daniel. And notice what it leads to. Verse 34, it says, You saw till, a, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Now you can look into the New Testament, Acts 4, verses 10 and 11, and see that this stone refers to Jesus Christ. And all these prophecies, together with that, that talk about Jesus Christ returning to this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. Read the last few verses of Revelation 11 sometime. When God establishes His kingdom on this earth and breaks in pieces all of the other kingdoms of men, that's what God is saying here, down in verse 44, he says further, And in the days of these kings, these human kingdoms and their leaders, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is the, the fifth kingdom. We've given a program before on that subject. We don't want to forget about God's kingdom. I mean, really, that's the whole focus of this prophecy. In the days of these kings, 
Now we'll talk more about the final ten kings to emerge uh, together in these last days. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but suffice it to say you have all of these world ruling kingdoms and then you have God's kingdom at the end. You have the return of Jesus Christ. Now moving ahead to Daniel 7. Look at the seventh chapter of Daniel and here you have uh, the prophet once again describing uh, these four kingdoms. This time he, he describes them as four beasts. They're representing these four Gentile kingdoms. And in chapter 7, the prophet puts uh, special emphasis on uh, the Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom. Notice what it says in verse 24. This is Daniel 7 now. Verse 24, it says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So if you know anything about secular history, history regarding the Roman Empire, it lasted from about 31 B.C. to 476 A.D. And then the Roman Empire, after years of decay and decline, it was crushed by these invading barbarian tribes. That happened, as I say, in 476 A.D. And so after that, well, the Roman Empire came to an end. Or did it? Here in the prophecy, God says that there's to be ten kings that shall arise out of or after that Roman Empire. Ten kings to come out of that same region, to come out of the heart of Europe. That's what your Bible prophesies. And then, of course, it mentions there in verse 24, another horn. Let's just back up to verse 8. Notice what the prophet says here. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And so up comes this little horn among the ten, and it plucks up the first three horns by the roots. It plucks them up. And then after that, there's seven more horns to come. This really is a significant verse here. This single verse, I mean, it's one of the most revealing in the book of Daniel. I mean, this is the key, really, understanding verse 8 in Daniel 7. That's the key to understanding European history over the past 1,500 years. Because following the demise of the Roman Empire in 476 A.D., you had these barbarian kingdoms that came in there, ruling in Europe, I won't get into all the details with that, but suffice it to say that in 554 A.D. with uh, Justinian, you have something that's new and different. This, this, this church-state relationship develops between the old Roman Empire and the Roman church. And from that point forward then, you have seven horns left. Seven resurrections, the three barbarian tribes plucked up by the roots by this Roman church, that's the little horn of Daniel 7 and verse 8. And then after that, seven resurrections of that old Roman Empire, but it's a church-state union. And this is discussed at length in the book of Revelation as well. We'll see here in just a second. Well, you can begin to turn over there. Revelation chapter 13. Actually, no, let's just read verse 9, because I don't want to overlook the fifth kingdom. Notice what it says in Daniel 7. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So here again, you see these kingdoms, these four world ruling kingdoms, and then you have the ten kingdoms to come out from that fourth kingdom. And it all leads right up to the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth. Now, let's go over to Revelation 13 and notice what it says here. Really, these four chapters that we'll just cover the highlights of today, Daniel 2 and 7, and then Revelation 13 and 17. This is, uh, this is really what Mr. Armstrong expounds upon in this wonderful and popular little booklet, Who or What is the Prophetic Beast? What is the meaning of these images, this great image in Daniel 2, and then the, the four beasts in Daniel 7? And then what we'll see here in uh, Revelation 13 as well. We'll start in Revelation 13 and verse 1. 
It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, this is John writing, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So in this prophecy, we see one beast, just one, with seven heads. Not four beasts with seven heads, like in Daniel 7, but just the one beast. Seven heads and then ten horns. And here again, these ten horns are those ten kingdoms that come out from the Roman Empire. I mean, here is John writing in the first century. And of course, so much of the, the history that Daniel talked about was already fulfilled, or the prophecy that he spoke of, those first three world-ruling kingdoms. And so here, here is John focusing on the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled the world during that first century. Its demise came in the fifth century AD. And then after that, the kingdoms, the three barbarian kingdoms, and then the seven resurrections of that holy Roman Empire. Now, if you continue here in Revelation 13, notice verse 3, it says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded uh, to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And so there was a time where it looked like it was over, or it didn't die, the beast didn't die, but one of the heads was wounded unto death. And so just like with, uh, with Daniel 7, you have these uh, foreign invaders coming in, the three barbarian tribes. It looked like the Roman Empire had ended, but then starting with Justinian, and then after him Charlemagne, and then some of the others. A lot of this is discussed in both of these two booklets that we'll offer you uh, today. Who or what is the prophetic beast and the Holy Roman Empire in prophecy? These are two of our more popular books. Make sure that you request the free literature today. But coming back to this wound, the wound is healed. And then what emerged, starting with Justinian? It's the, that same old Roman Empire that, that these European leaders always are wanting to revive and resurrect. Notice verse 5. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. This is very similar language to what you'll find in Daniel 7 and verse 8, which we read. A mouth speaking great things. You have this church-state union. You have this, this powerful empire guided by this powerful church speaking great things. Notice what else Revelation 13 brings out. This is verse 11. Again, talking about speaking great things. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. You see it in the first couple verses. The spirit of the dragon is behind the, Satan the devil. He's behind this system. And then he's behind this other beast that looks like a, a very religious lamb, speaking like a lamb. But in fact, it's a, it's a dragon that's motivating and inspiring this beast. It might look religious, but look closely at what it's saying. Look, at, look closely at what's, what's forming. Here again, just one more verse before we break. Verse 12 says, And he exercises all the power of the first beasts before him and causes the earth and them which dwell thereon to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This, this system, this religious system, causes the people of that empire to worship the beast. And so in Daniel 7, you have this little horn that uproots the first three. Here in uh, Revelation 13, you have this beast that looks like a lamb working together with this dreadful beast described in the first part of chapter 13. And then when we get to Revelation 17, after the break, you have this beast that's being straddled by a woman. Here again, some different imagery in all three chapters, but it's the same. It's the same prophecy, this church-state union, for much more on this, and really our latest trumpet goes into this as well, the, the dark ages, as it says there, 
going through again some of the history that Europe is trying to resurrect. I've already mentioned the Who or What is the Prophetic Beast booklet, but this one here, an in-depth study of the Holy Roman Empire. Many, as I say, many are wanting to revive the legacy of the Holy Roman Empire. This talks a lot about that history. Is it something that we want to revive? As I say, jot down the information on your screen and make sure you order all of the free material that we're offering today. We'll be right back. The Trumpet Daily. Charlemagne has been called the forefather of modern Europe. It's, as I said at the top of the show, it's his legacy that many prominent officials in uh, Europe want to revive. Let me take you to a quote from the Holy Roman Empire in Prophecy. It says here, it remains a mystery to most people today, but when political and religious leaders talk about reviving the spirit of Charlemagne, this is what they're talking about. A single empire united under one leader and one church. The question is, how far are Europe's leaders willing to go to resurrect the legacy of Charlemagne, a single empire under one ruler, now, now, that leader is prophesied in Daniel 8. I don't have time to get into all of these prophecies. But again, and just looking back at the history, Charlemagne waded through rivers of blood. I mean, just because we're centuries away from that history doesn't mean it wasn't brutal or horrific. It was. It was. Is that what we want to resurrect? He resurrected the Roman Empire. He was in Rome. 800 A.D., celebrating uh, during a Christmas celebration, bowing down. And that's when the Pope crowned him as emperor of the, the Fourth World Empire. That was the language they used. They knew the Roman Empire was the fourth. Well, that's prophesied in your Bible. We've gone through it today. It's in Daniel 2. The fourth world empire. How about that? Notice now Revelation 17. As I said, we, we're going through these four chapters, just hitting the high spots. Daniel 2 and 7. Revelation 13 and, and 17. Verse 3 here it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here again is just one beast. And in this particular vision, these seven heads represent seven resurrections of the Holy Roman Empire. Now six of them have come and gone. And Herbert Armstrong was talking about the seventh for decades. And we've continued in that same, that same tradition, basing our projection in these many prophecies that we're here discussing. Well, here in Revelation 17, as I mentioned before the break, you have the woman, and you can go through numerous scriptures to see how that a woman is often used as a type of a church. In this case, it's a great false church. And here is a woman straddling the beast. That means she holds sway over these seven heads. She's guiding these seven resurrections. I mean, the beast is a beast. The beast is stronger. But, but the woman riding the beast... She's giving the influence or guiding the beast, carrying out some of the worst historical atrocities of mankind. Verse 4, look at how the Bible describes this. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness and her, of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. Really what the Bible describes it as is it's a very unholy empire. Here is this mysterious Babylonian religion, and she has a lot of daughters, daughter churches, and the beliefs are pretty much the same. I mean, there's something for everyone in this world. But for the most part, the core beliefs are about the same with the mother and all the daughters. And verse 9, it says here, And here in the, the mind, and here is the mind which has wisdom, 
The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So these seven resurrections, it's like seven mountains where you have peaks and valleys. For a time, it might look like it's over and done with. And then here comes another Charlemagne, or Otto the Great, or the Habsburg Dynasty, or Napoleon, or Hitler. And there's to be one more, one more in these last days. Even H.G. Wells, in his, his history book, Outline of History, he, he described the Roman Empire this way, saying it staggers, it sprawls, is thrust off the stage, and then it reappears. And then here it comes again. Here it comes out into the open. I mean, that's been the history. That's been the history, and this is the way it's prophesied. And God prophesied it. He prophesied all of this before any of it happened. It's amazing what insight the Bible gives to us. Verse 10, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And my father's written about this before, about the reason it's, it's described this way is that five had come and gone. One is, one happened right during the ministry of Herbert Armstrong, and he was sounding the alarm. He was telling the world about these prophecies you're hearing about right now today on this program. But he died, Herbert Armstrong did, before the emergence of the seventh head. So one is, that's the one during his, his ministry. And one is yet to come. And when he comes, he'll continue just a short space. It's short-lived, but it is coming. Verse 12, it says, And the ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but uh, receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And you can see the way that these ten here are described. They have one mind. They're working together. They're contemporaneous. This is not talking about the successive kings. We've seen about those ten described in Daniel 7 and verse 8. The ten that come out from the Roman Empire. The ten different kingdoms in succession. Here it's ten kings coming together at that last resurrection. Ten kings coming out of the heart of Europe, led by one Charlemagne type, you could say. And that's what my father goes into in this Trumpet magazine. And it's important that you subscribe to this trumpet, as I've, as I've explained recently on programs. We're conducting a, a series of public Bible lectures all across Britain, and we invite those who subscribe to our Trumpet magazine. If you like what you hear on this program, you need to attend one of those public lectures because these are the kinds of prophecies that we get into, that we expound upon, and that you need to understand. Jesus said, watch and pray always. You've got to watch world events and know and understand why they're happening and what's coming. God will tell you. He will. Notice verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. See, they're all together. They're all of one. I mean, what you see in Europe today, it's about to be reconfigured. You watch for it. Watch for the ten. That's coming, and it's coming soon. But notice, as we've seen, notice what it all leads right into. This is verse 14. Then these shall make war with the Lamb. See, this is not a legacy that's going to bring peace. It's not going to bring a utopia to Europe or anywhere. It's going to lead to a confrontation with the Lamb, with Jesus Christ. It says, And the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. You see, you see how it gets right back to the fifth kingdom. Once again, this is what it all leads to. These four world-ruling kingdoms, and then the ten that come out from that fourth one, and then the final that final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire, there's seven of those, and that's composed of ten kings that come together out of the heart of Europe. That's what we see forming right now in Europe. Make sure, as I say, if you haven't subscribed already, that you subscribe to the Trumpet magazine. We'll ask the operator for that. In addition to the booklets, be specific. Say that you want the magazine as well, and then these two to, I mean, to really go into an in-depth study of what we've gone through today, request the Holy Roman Empire in prophecy and who or what is the prophetic beast. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.